All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to uh, welcome to grad school. This is uh, the penultimate professional development event put on by the graduate school this semester. Uh, it's great to have all of you here today. Um, we have a great uh, panel of, of speakers uh, from all across campus here to talk with you and to share all of the resources and opportunities available to graduate students here at Wayne State. My name is Nick Patar. I am the Associate Director of Marketing and Communications at the Graduate School. Um, I'll be also be your MC today. So um, we'll jump right into it. Um, we have Graduate School Dean, Dr. Amanda Bryant Friedrich here today. She is going to kick off today's event, uh, go through some of the essentials from Graduate School, and uh, we will go from there into the rest of our session. So, uh, Dr. Amanda, uh, feel free to take it away. Thank you, Nick. It's really nice to be here today. I'm sitting here on the 11th floor of the Maccabees building and I'm looking out of the window at beautiful, beautiful Detroit. And I have an incredible view of Old Main. So if you're ever over this way and you wanna come by and visit my office, I will definitely share my view with you. I was even fortunate enough today to go out on the roof uh, to actually see the campus in the fresh air. I will not let you do that because we are up on the 11th floor. <laughs> so I thank you everybody for organizing our grad school today, our grad school welcome today and giving me the opportunity to get to talk to my wonderful, wonderful grad students. I have to tell you that I get up every morning knowing that I got the best job in the world because I get to come to Wayne State and I get to come and I get to talk to you guys. I get to see you on campus. I get to do the things that are important for you so that I can make sure that you're getting the education that you deserve. So um, the mission statement is on the screen at the moment and the mission statement actually tells you exactly why it is we exist and what are we here for. So academic excellence is key. When you've already gone through obtaining an undergraduate degree, you've already learned what academic excellence is all about because you did the work and you did well, and now you're in graduate school. And so you're continuing that journey. Um, you're a master's student or a doctoral student. Some folks may be professional students. You know, we. We have all different designations of who you are, and uh, I would love to hear from you today to tell me how you're experiencing Wayne State from those different categories, because that's an important piece for me. Uh, we're also here to make sure that postdoctoral fellows, which are those folks who have done the hard work of getting that ultimate degree, and they're continuing their training. So we are also the home of those individuals, and we provide as much support as we can. Um, we know that what you do is hard. Uh, we've all done it. <laughs> we've gone through graduate school. We've done the hard work. We've gotten to the positions where we are. My associate deans that are here are all scholars in their own right doing incredible work and they know the hard work. And I was fortunate enough to inherit excellent people and I have also gone on the hunt and found some great people and brought them in to make sure that your journey is one that is going to get you to where you want to be. We believe in diversity. We believe in diversity in all of its forms. And that's an important part of who we are and what we are and why we exist is to make sure that that diversity is maintained. Um, we believe in equity. We believe very strongly that everyone is supposed to have the opportunity to do their very best. And we are here to provide the resources to make sure that happens and we want you to feel that you're a part. So we definitely believe in inclusion and everybody uses those DEI terms, but inclusion to me is everything because when you walk onto this campus, I want you to walk onto this campus with your head high and your chest out like you own the place because in the end of the day you do. And that's what I want you to see. So um, my mantra, mantra, I always use this and, uh, Nick is always uh, laughing at me because it comes up from time to time, but I have decided that I am going to professionally dedicate my life to opening doors to an inclusive and welcoming and supportive environment that fosters success. Now, we can pause there. What does that all mean? 
that means then that we're going to make sure that when you do come on this campus and you stick out your chest and you raise your head and you say that you own this place, that no one is going to come to you and say, no, you don't, you don't belong here. We want to make sure that that never happens. And unfortunately we can't, we do our best. And when someone actually does tell you, you don't belong here, you come up here to the 11th floor and tell me that they did that and I'll go find them. So that's how I feel about that, please. I have been challenged for the rest of my mantra, which says that if um, we want to give success for all who have the ability and the desire to participate in the academic enterprise, well, I do believe that you have to have a certain level of ability. Graduate education is difficult and you have to be able to decide whether or not you have the ability to persist. And it's not about just having raw talent or, or those kinds of things, but this an ability to be able to come in here, persist, be resilient, and, and actually take advantage of all of the opportunities that we can give you. So that's my personal mantra, and that's an important part of understanding who I am. So now talking about what we do broadly, we want to make sure that you understand that we are the unit on campus that oversees the integrity and quality of your program. What does that mean to you? If you get a degree from an institution that is not accredited or doesn't have the type of reputation, it devalues your degree. So Wayne State's degrees have a reputation globally that they are of the highest quality and they have prepared the trainees to do the very best work that they can. We are the ones who set the policies and procedures so if you're really, really tired of the fact that you have to do all of these goals and milestones, that's our fault. You have to actually get to certain places on the journey to be successful. And those journeys, those points on your journey are not there just for us to torture you, but they're there for us to make sure that you're getting what you deserve, that you're getting what you need in order to be successful. So please see it that way when you have to do your qualifying exams or when you're doing capstones and master's programs, that's the reason that they're there. Um, we are here to provide the resources in the form of funding. We do a lot of that. And we're here to also recognize when you've done well. So we also provide awards. There are also fellowships and scholarships that can be found in your academic college which is, of course, they all work very, very closely with the graduate school. So understand that nothing happens in your academic college in the graduate world that the grad school doesn't know about. At least we're supposed to know about it. Sometimes we don't know everything, but we try our best to be nosy and know everything. Um, and we also are here to run the professional development series because we have a broad overview of the kinds of things that you're facing as someone who's getting a master's, a certificate, or a PhD or a professional degree and what you're going to be facing when you go out. So we can do that from a broad perspective. The Office of Postdoctoral Affairs is key for us to understand exactly where our folks are going. We look at postdoctoral affairs, of course, is the area where most people are getting ready to go into the academy. Now, there are some areas where postdocs also go into industrial positions, they go into government related positions, all of those kinds of things. But we see postdoctoral training as a very broad based area where people are just getting the extra um, work that done or the extra attention to the part of their career that they actually want to pursue. So if you want to think about it, you can kind of think about it like as a, a physician who's going on to do residencies and fellowships to specialize. And that's kind of what the postdoctoral fellowships do. And that's what we try to offer those resources for. Um, so if I had to tell you anything, about what is important when you decide to make the transition from an undergraduate program to a graduate program. The first thing is that I would say is that you need to make sure that you establish relationships. Graduate education is much more relationship oriented than undergrad. So you realize that if you're at the doctoral level, only 6% of the global population gets a doctorate. So that's the first thing that you kind of want to remember. You're a part of a very small group of people. That's the number I got probably about 10 years ago. It might be different now. I'm going to have to look that up again. But you need to build those relationships. And the first person that you usually interact with is the graduate director of your program. 
And that person is there because they understand everything that's going on at the program level. The graduate school is here at the university level, but you need to know what's going on directly for your program because every program has its special nuances and things that are important because we're looking at very different disciplines. Then of course, it's the faculty and the other students. So your training is not just done by the graduate program director, you come in, you're put into classrooms again, the classroom setting is smaller, it's more intimate. You're sitting there, you're a few feet away usually from your professor. That is um, for a very particular reason because now you're almost in an apprentice mode. You need to learn to understand what that person is trying to deliver to you, how they're delivering it to you, and to actually understand the demeanor and the professionalism that's involved in your area. So all of those things are important in that in your um, in your first days when you join your program. The other students are going to tell you where the bodies are buried and what's under every rock. So I don't like surprises. So make sure that you get to know the other students in your program. And I know COVID made that hard. I know some of you are doing almost everything online, but an email can do a lot. I am mentoring many, many students out there in the world as a mentor who I've never met face to face. And so people will do that for you. Just tell them a little bit about who you are and other students will connect with you, faculty will connect with you, all of those kinds of things. So the other thing is I wanted you to know is that as the Dean of the Graduate School here and my colleagues here who are in the Graduate School, we understand that life happens while life is happening. So you are living while you're being a graduate student. So we know that sometimes things might get tough as far as finances, you may need food, you may need housing, you may need medical care, you may need anything. You may need somebody to just kick you and say, you need to get up and do your work. We can provide a lot of those different things on campus. So you can see here all the resources and we have some folks here gonna to talk to you about those. And try to do something outside of, the, out of school. Um, you are a mature individual when you're in graduate school and you should be involved in other things because you have to have some joy in life because grad school is hard. And most of the I would say in, when I was in graduate school, 60% of my time I was having a ball, 40% of the time I wanted to run away. And that was when I would actually go and do something that I like, like read a book, go see a movie, hang out with friends, you know, all that kind of stuff. So make sure that you have something to do outside of work. And that's the same advice that I give to my colleagues too. We also have to have lives outside of work. The professional development series that's done here is excellent. My colleagues are in charge of it. I have no say in it really. They just come and tell me what they're gonna do. And I say, okay, go ahead on and do that. And they do a fantastic job. So you've seen some of the events. I was really happy that we had uh, Stock Market 101. We had an, a person who came in and actually delivered content there. You guys are gonna make money. You're going to grad school because you're gonna make a little money. You need to know what to do with that money. So I was really happy about that. And you need to find out how to actually make sure that you get the job you want. So the LinkedIn branding thing, you are a brand. Uh, I didn't really understand that until probably about 10 years ago. And I'm not a young woman. So I understand that Amanda Brand Friedrich is a brand. So that's what you need to understand. Um, you need to look at this winter semester schedule. You need to know when things are happening. Don't fall behind because you didn't look at the calendar. Uh, I have a son here who is a sophomore. I have to tell him that still. Look at the calendar and see what the university is doing. You got to be on time. So you make sure that you do that uh, and register on the, the grad school website. So, and last, my last slide actually here, if I can get it to advance, tells you to mark your calendars for two things that we're really excited about. And that's the Graduate Research Symposium and Three Minute Thesis Competition. I love the Three Minute Thesis Competition because it's the time that I get to see what my, what my graduate students, and yes, you're mine. I don't care what college you're in, you're still mine. Uh, I get to see what you're working on, what's occupying your time, what's giving you joy, what's confusing to you. I get to see all of that. And then the second week of April, we're also going to get do Graduate Student Appreciation Week. And I would love to hear from you. What can we do to show you that you're appreciated? And you, you actually fulfill a very important role at the institution. Don't forget that. 
And so it is not for uh, any small reason that we show you our appreciation because we need you. Without you, the university would not be able to advance in research and in scholarly activities and its creativity, we need you. So thank you for letting me just blow into your ear for a little while and see what you're thinking about. And I get, look forward to hearing from you. I'll give it back to you now, Nick. Thanks, Dr. Amanda. And as, uh, as you have questions, as anybody has questions, please feel free to put them into the chat. Um, we will either try to address them in the middle of the session um, or somebody from the graduate school may answer it right in the chat there for you as well. Um, also, uh, just so Dr. Amanda is not done here, she will be back in our next section. Um, so if you have questions that came out of those first group of slides, feel free to ask them anytime. Um, but I also know that um, after our next, we'll have a couple more sections here of the event and then they will be open for Q&A. So um, if you have any questions queued up, please get those ready. Um, and there will be ample time for us to answer all of your questions coming up here at the end. Uh, but next, I'd like to introduce a couple of our guests. Um, and first off, here we have Tony Grant from the Campus Health Center. If you'd like to go ahead, Tony, and, uh, and go ahead and take it away. Taking one too many clicks in order to get to the screen, but welcome everyone and thank you for being here. I'm uh, so an alum uh, graduate from the graduate program here at Wayne State, class of 2011. So um, I, as you, have been in many of these different um, settings. So I'm here to talk to you all today about Campus Health Center, the Campus Health Center. I am the chief nursing officer there. And I just wanted to introduce and reintroduce the um, clinic to you all. Campus Health Center actually moved into its new location in April of 2019. So it is a beautiful facility located right on Anthony Wayne Drive at the corner of Kirby, uh, across the street from Dunkin' Donuts and right on the first floor of Anthony Wayne Drive Apartments. We are there open to service the campus community from nine in the morning until 5.30 in the afternoon. We have a host of services. We are there. We can provide any and everything that you may need. We do anything from health clearances, physical exams. <clears throat> we take care of everything from the head to toe. You have acute needs. We take care of you when you need that. As far as codes, cuts, bruises, Lately, we've been seeing a lot of road rash because of the number of scooters that are on campus. Also your routine care, if you have chronic conditions as asthma or diabetes, we'll work with you also in weight loss, <clears throat> smoking sensation. <clears throat> All of your immunization needs, we can take care of those as well. Any men's health, women's health needs. We also have the Get Yourself Tested Clinic. We also have PrEP that's available through the clinic as well. We do a lot of community education of whatever topics are requested, anything that we may see trends of across the campus. We try to also provide that education to individuals as well. Our website hosts a ton of information on a variety of different topics and things. It has a lot of information there. A lot of that I wanted to start off with because most of that has been lost because for the last year and a half, we have been dealing with COVID. So most of you probably know Campus Health is where you go to get COVID tested, to get your COVID vaccine, to get your flu vaccine, but we are much more than that. So in the midst of all of the pandemic, we have been able to service the Wayne State community as well. We've been serving as Wayne State's um, public health department. So all of the contact tracing that has been occurring on campus has actually come from Campus Health Center. One of the other things I wanted to let you guys know about is our reduced cost in condoms. So you can also pay by the month, get condoms for, for almost little or nothing if you're part of the condom club. So almost anything that you can think of that you can want or need, 
we can actually provide those services. Prior to the pandemic, our clinic was seeing approximately 10,000 visits a year. Now in the midst of the pandemic, we're up to 25,000 visits a year. So I'm asking to please be patient with telephone calls. Um, we upgraded our phone system in the midst of all of that, but believe it or not, we, the phone still cannot handle the volume. So we've doubled the number of telephones that we have in our clinic in order to handle the volume of calls. And we're still having a difficult time with the phone lines being able to handle that. They max out at 100 messages apiece. Um, we've added to additional lines. So now you may have tons of different numbers that you may be referred to. Um, it's important that you keep those numbers. Each have play a very significant role and will get you directly to where you need. We also have voicemail, so if you leave a message, we will definitely get back with you. You can get us by email as well, and you can also get us through our answering service for after hours. So we are here, your full service clinic right here on campus to take care of anything that you may need. I think I am done. Just wanted to give you all a brief overview of campus health and the many services that we have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony. Yeah, that was some, those are some really eye-opening numbers there uh, in the, the jump from, from 10,000 to 25. That is um, really stunning. I, I, my jaw just about dropped. So um, again, if you have any questions, um, I know Tony has to run um, before the end of the session here, but you can still funnel those questions to us and we'll be sure that those get over to the Campus Health Center. Um, so. So now I'll provide my email address. You can feel free to, if you have any questions, to feel free to email me directly. I'll send that in the chat to everyone. Thank you. That's I'm awesome. sorry I have Thanks. to take off so quickly. All right. Well, our next uh, guest speaker here today, we have Jeff Kinzel. He's from the Counseling and Psych Psychological Services, or CAPS, as you may know it. Um, and I believe Jeff has a slide there to show as well. So, Jeff, uh, take it away. Okay. Um, so um, I am also um, an alum, went to graduate school here in the 1990s. I've been at Wayne State continuously for 30 years. Um, did my postdoc at Wayne State as well. Um, don't remember a professional development series when I was a grad student, um, sure would have been helpful because this is awesome. Um, so I'm going to um, spend a few minutes telling you about what we do at CAPS. So um, three key things. So we are an accredited comprehensive counseling center that offers uh, clinical services, a pretty big range of different clinical services, um, including our bread and butter, which is individual counseling. We have a bunch of groups. Uh, group therapy um, is underutilized and underappreciated as a very powerful um, therapeutic modality. So. Um, for uh, a few mental health issues, a group is actually better than individual. Um, we also have psychiatry. So that's a medical doctor who prescribes medication if appropriate for different mental health conditions. We have a case manager. Actually right now we're in between case managers, but um, that is a specialist for um, finding resources in the community um, for um, clinical needs that CAPS um, can't meet, um, especially on the more severe side. Um, all of these services are provided free to currently enrolled Wayne State students. Um, so um, for that free service, um, 
just similar to uh, as Dr. Grant was saying, um, we ask for a little bit of patience uh, because uh, at least for the individual counseling, uh, we can run a waiting list at times. Um, but what's really important to realize is that um, you're going to have multiple other valuable services available to you um, while you wait, if you wait. Um, so students are prioritized based on clinical need. And so if it is determined um, professional clinical judgment that it's all right for you to wait a while, you still can use other services. So you may be able to go into a group immediately. Um, you can use at the bottom, you can see our after hours number. You can use that the entire time that you are at Wayne State, including weekends in the middle of the night if you need somebody to talk to. So we have that option. We have something that also is underutilized called Let's Talk. So in multiple locations around campus and also um, remotely using Zoom, we have drop-in sessions with counselors. So if you're considering counseling and you're on the fence about it, um, a good way to test it out would be to drop in to a Let's Talk session and talk to a counselor. You're under no obligation to continue and you just try it out. You could even ask the counselor, do you think I would benefit from counseling? Um, so we love Let's Talk. So you can see um, details on our website about that. So um, most of our services continue to be offered remotely using Microsoft Teams. Um, so on a very limited basis, we can do in-person um, but um, we have found that um, our conversion over to remote services has been a huge success. Students really like it. So if the picture in your mind um, is that it would be um, uncomfortable or not helpful to meet with a counselor um, through a video session like this, you should try it out because um, it's very likely that you're gonna end up um, really appreciating it. Um, it's very convenient if, for people with tight schedules like all graduate students have because there's no commuting back and forth to CAPS. So um, we really have been pleased uh, with the response to um, our online services. Um, Microsoft Teams, uh, we had this reviewed by the Office of General Counsel and it is judged to be um, HIPAA level of security and very private. And it's even private in a way we hadn't realized ahead of time, which is um, if you come to CAPS and sit in our waiting area, that is less private um, than if you are meeting with us from your own space um, through a video session. Um, even though, of course, generally um, privacy is very good at CAPS too, but you never know who you might run into if they're very busy. So we really um, do recommend um, that you use uh, remote services um, versus just uh, being uh, laser focused on in-person is the only way to go. Um, you'll probably find out um, that you feel differently if you give it a try. Um, so, if you want to begin um, the process to get set up with an individual counselor at CAPS or even group therapy or psychiatry or these other services, you're going to um, go to our website and see the part right in front of you that says requesting CAPS services. And uh, that's how um, you complete the first step and then you'll get to pick an appointment for your initial consultation and go from there. So um, that's an overview of what we do. One other thing I will highlight is um, how common it is for college students and um, definitely for graduate students to um, struggle with their mental health. Um, so it's been all over the popular media for the last couple of years, especially uh, because of the pandemic, that the mental health of uh, Students um, has really been um, challenged 
uh, by the pandemic, but even before the pandemic, um, CAPS was really, really busy um, servicing thousands of students. Um, so don't hesitate um, if you're not sure. Um, one other thing you can do if you're not sure, aside from going to a Let's Talk session, is to complete a screening. So also right in the middle of our homepage, you will see a mental health screening, which of course is anonymous and free and available 24 hours a day. And you can go in there and screen yourself for a variety of mental health conditions and get personalized feedback about um, whether you may have a problem in a particular area and uh, whether or not it's recommended that you seek professional help. So we call that the um, mental health, the, the checkup from the neck up. Um, so you can do that. Um, but just know that, um, that it's very common and from one perspective, it's normal. Um, to struggle with your mood or to have anxiety. And really the key is um, if you are not functioning um, at the level you want to be due to um, emotional difficulties or behavioral difficulties, then help is available. And there's really no good reason why you shouldn't avail yourself of that help. So that is all I have about Caps. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, and if uh, and again, if anybody does have questions or um, want wants to reach out to Caps, um, Jeff, I don't know if you're open to taking emails as well. But if you absolutely you can you can share your contact information in the chat as well. Um, that would be great. And now we're going to transition over to our student discussion. We have the two graduate ambassadors that are here today um, that are going to share a little bit about their experiences. Uh, Dr. Amanda will return to the virtual stage here to, uh, to kind of oversee, moderate this panel. Um, we have two graduate ambassadors. We have Tracy Boyce, who um, is PhD and also works in the College of Education. And we have Tiara Hinton, um, who, uh, who is uh, actually both Tracy and Tiara are uh, second year ambassadors and um, have been, been just excellent representatives of the graduate school and all graduate students here over the past uh, year and a half now. So uh, I will turn it back over to Dr. Amanda here for, uh, for this next ses session. Thanks, Nick. It's uh, nice to see you, Tracy and Tiara. Um, thank you very much for allowing me to grill you for a few minutes for the benefit of our new graduate students and those who are interested in graduate school. So I would love for you guys to just take a minute to introduce yourselves, tell people where you are, what you're doing, how long you've been here and things like that, and where you're from. Tracy, go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Tracy Boyce. I am a PhD student in the College of Education. I'm studying learning design and technology. And my research is focused on Black women digital entrepreneurs who are, I guess I'm going to say, accidental instructional designers. Um, so basically, uh, people who design learning products but don't really have any ex experience or background in, in designing and developing them. Um, I am originally from Detroit. I um, have gotten uh, two master's degrees and um, an education specialist certificate from Wayne State. I am a uh, lifelong stu student. My, my sister's always teasing me like, she's, you're always in school. I told her after I get this, this degree, I'm done. I'm not, not doing it anymore. Um, she doesn't believe me, but we'll see. Um, <laughs> And um, I, th I think that's it. I, oh, I work in the College of Education. I'm the Associate Director of Marketing and Communications. And uh, I'm a student, and a graduate student ambassador. I was interested in this because um, I'm hoping that we can uh, build some more community among, um, among graduate students on campus. Fantastic, Tracy. Thank you so much. Tiara? Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Tiara Hinton. Um, I am a fourth year PhD candidate in the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences. Um, my research uh, centers on the iron binding mechanisms of iron sulfur um, cluster assembly proteins. 
um, specifically for taxin in the Drosophila system. So um, that is something that is completely new and interesting to me as I have a bachelor's in chemistry from uh, Morgan State University in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I'm originally from Prince George's County, Maryland, which is about 15 minutes outside of DC and an hour outside of Baltimore. Um, and let me see, at Wayne State, I do a lot of things. Um, so I'm a third year graduate ambassador. I am a surge mentor. I um, am also the senior member of my lab. And I'm on the e-board of an organization um, called POISE. It's, stands for People of Intense Self-Expression. Um, it's fashion, modeling, community service, um, things like that. And was there anything else I was supposed to say? No, you're good. <laughs> okay, I always That's forget. Enough, honey. I start you talking. said enough. <laughs> <laughs> you do a lot of stuff. I thank you so much. Chantel, thank you. Please go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, everyone from the car. Uh, my name is Chantel Kamen. I am a master's of business administration student, or MBA student at the Illich School of Business. My concentration is information systems management. I also work for the graduate schools. So I'm an outreach specialist here. I'm the president of Wayne Black Business Student Association. We've given out, excuse me, over $3,000 in scholarships to undergraduate students, high school students. So we try to network students to uh, students of color to get into the business and to pursue their degree in that way. Excellent, thank you so much. So I guess my first question that I have to ask you guys, and uh, Tiara, I'm gonna target you with this one because you moved here to actually go to graduate school. Um, when you first mm -hmm. moved to the area and came to campus, what was the most overwhelming feeling that you had? The most overwhelming feeling I had was have, being on a campus that was not centralized. Um, where I came from, we were at Morgan State is a public university, but it's kind of fenced in like there's a fence around it, but it's not fenced in so campus was a mile long like everything there was academic quad the dorms were at the other end of campus like everything was right there here um I didn't grow up in the city I didn't live in the city um Morgan was right outside of the city so here being I lived on main campus my first year so everything was kind of there the student center the library some most of the academic buildings but the pharmacy building is um a mile or two down the street so, and it's technically on the med campus, but it's on the far end of the med campus. So it's not even really near the medical school. So that was um, one of the most overwhelming things for me. Also learning to parallel park. <laughs> 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 I had to teach myself. I know the theory of parallel parking. I know what it is I'm supposed to do, but I had to physically teach myself because that wasn't, they took it off of the Maryland um, driving test because we don't have, we have parking lots and driveways. So um, those were the two overwhelming things for me. That's funny, I love that. Um, I can imagine that the first time I actually parallel part was also in Detroit. So I know exactly how you feel. So Tracy, you're a member of the Wayne State community from a variety of perspectives. And so I would love for you to just address what do you think, how do you perceive the campus as inclusion, as in the, from the perspective of inclusion? Do you think it's an inclusive campus? Um, I certainly think there are many different, and the campus is diverse in terms of um, the different ethnicities and nationalities of people that are on campus, yes. Um, I do think there are also opportunities for students to get involved in uh, different organizations such as the Black Student Union or um, um, you know, other, th other things in, in different uh, community organizations where they can get involved in supporting diversity, equity, and in inclusion. Um, I'm trying to think of some off the top of my head. Um, I know there are um, Black Greek fraternities and sororities. Um, there are um, organizations like New Detroit, uh, the Detroit NAACP. Um, there are organizations in Southwest Detroit um, that are committed to uh, the Latinx community. We have the Center for um, Latino Latinx Studies on campus. 
Um, and also there's the Office of Multicultural Student Engagement here. Um, then there's the Arab American community in Dearborn. There's, there's lots of uh, different outlets. And I think uh, the city itself is very, there's lots of uh, culture in our city. I mean, there's all types of food if you like to eat. Um, and there are just lots of different things to do. I mean, we have the African American Museum and just lots of other things. So I think there is a lot of opportunity here and there's a lot of opportunity to explore, to learn, um, and to live in a uh, community that is um, diverse. So I'm going to interpret for everyone what Tracy just said. She said <laughs> that there's the opportunity for inclusion, but we're not there yet. Okay, that's exactly what I heard. That's what you um, heard. That's exactly what I heard. And as uh, an administrator at the university, I, I have the uh, the responsibility to interpret messages. And okay. so um, because of what Tracy just said, I want to offer to all of you who are here on this call today is to really think about what it means to be inclusive. Think about what it means to have an inclusive campus and to actually work from your own personal perspective to make it feel that way for everyone. Um, there's a lot of work to be done and the different perspectives actually are not always clear to those of us who sit in seats like me. So make sure that you talk about these things. That's really important. And thank you, Tracy, for your perspective on that. I'm gonna ask Chantel to talk about finding your tribe. And this is a term that I use um, very often because I, I think that way but no one gets through things easily on their own. So Chantel, talk to them about finding their tribe. Uh, thanks, uh, I think that's a great question. I mean, as someone who had a big break before I started back to school, there were so many excuses that I had to say like, oh, I, I'm not gonna be academically ready because I haven't been to school in a while. I have family commitments, I have all these other commitments, partner commitments, all these things that I was saying that I, this is just going to be something that I can't do. However, once I came to the Ellis School of Business, I found my tribe. Um, immediately, like I said, I founded a, a student organization where I became the president. We work with, have study tables on Sundays where, you know, you can come and study, even if you didn't have a subject. Because for me, I didn't always have a subject that others had at that time, but it made me have this dedicated time to study. And so that I could really make sure that I'm on top of my things. And in addition to that, it also helped me <clears throat> to just find other people to network with, to say, okay, where are you? Where are you in your career? What are you doing? What are some things that I could do as well? And we just help each other in that way. So even if you think right now, you may not have those people to, or you don't know anyone, I guarantee you, once you get into that classroom, once you get into that building, you'll start to find that tribe that can help you get through this. Because at the end of the day, this is not something you can do by yourself. This is not a solo gig. You will need some people to help and help you lean on and maybe talk you off the tower sometime when you uh, have all these classes to deal with. Thank you, Chantel. Very good. Tiara, talk to me a little bit about the financial side of being a graduate student. Um, I am sure that some of your friends graduated and went on and took jobs and they're making a lot more money than you are while you're still here trying to get through grad school. So talk to me about the financial aspects of that and why you've made the choice. Um, okay, so I guess why I made the choice, I don't do, I didn't, decide to get a PhD or decide to be a scientist for money. It's something that I genuinely enjoy doing. And I know that there's other benefits to it um, at the end. I do have a friend um, who is a civil, she graduated with well, the year after me, who um, she's a civil engineer and she is making a lot more money than I am. But in, in the way that I think about it is that, um, that's like industry and academia in, in my field specifically. Usually people in industry, which is kind of what she's in, she at an engineering company, they make a lot more money than people who are in academia. Also in graduate school, I think that I'm still being trained to do something. I do have skills, but I'm learning, 
I'm learning something completely different. I'm in a whole nother arena in my um in my field. So I'm still learning and being trained to do things. So um, I'm not going to make as much money as an expert per se, um, because I'm not there yet. However, also in my particular situation, I didn't have a job growing up. I didn't have a job in undergrad. Research was my first job and I was a junior when I actually began to get paid to do research. I had been doing it all four years, but I didn't start actually making money until my junior year. So um, I am now making more than I was making then, but I have more skills. So it's like, as your skill set increases, so does your pay rate. Um, however, the one thing I forgot to add is I'm a Dean's Diversity Fellow. That was the other thing. So I, knew, I, I was wondering, but anyway. <laughs> couldn't think I was like I do so many things I don't know the last thing was I'm a Dean's Diversity Fellow as well so I'm funded through the graduate school and I have a stipend and it is um an amount that you know it carries me I'm not I don't need I'm not wanting for anything I'm not broke in the stigma of broke broke college student broke grad student broke PhD student yes but no not really um I have the things that I need to you know get through this point in my life and get through this process and I know that soon and very soon I'll be making more than what some might turn their nose up at to me not coming from a place where I had a job and I was making x amount of money I'm good with where I am for you know this point in time for what it is that I'm doing so um I hope that that answered the question it does it does and I, I remember myself thinking I'm not doing this for the money, but then as I made it uh, higher in higher professional levels, I realized that first of all, money is society, especially in the United States way of showing that you're valued. So it's the thing that you do have to pay attention to. And I'm a person who believes in giving away a lot of money. So the more money I make, the more I can give away. So I changed my way of thinking over the years. So you'll, you'll see that that comes. I'm sure it will, because I know you. Uh, Tracy, I want you to talk about something that you mentioned when you mentioned your sister. I want you to talk about family. How does family actually mesh with the whole idea of you being someone who has a full-time job, is in grad school, trying to get that DR dot in front of your name. What, what is family saying? How are they experiencing this? Okay, so uh, my family is very important to me, first of all. Um, I spend a lot of time with them. I have three children. Um, my mother is a uh, cancer survivor and I'm her caregiver. So I'm a caregiver, I'm a full-time employee. I'm a mom of uh, young people. Uh, my kids, uh, two of them graduated from college a short while ago and I have my youngest son is still in college. He graduates this year and I cannot wait. Um, but all of that said, um, my family is very supportive. Uh, my mother is an educator. Uh, she was a teacher, a reading specialist, um, and an administrator in the Detroit Public Schools for 30 years. Um, I have, my grandmother was a teacher. There's so many people in my family who were in education. So for, for us, education is like the key to, to success. That's what I was always taught, that, that you have to get an education. You have to, and as soon as I finished my bachelor's degree, my mother was like, when are you going to go get your master's? And when I finished my master's degree, she was like, when are you going to go get your doctorate? Um, so now after this is over, she'll stop bugging me. Um, but my family has been very supportive. Um, it, I'm an older graduate student, as you can probably tell, since I said my kids were in college. Um, but part of that is because, you know, I knew that I wanted to get my PhD, but I felt like my kids are in college and I need to help my kids make sure they get their bachelor's degree before I start working on my PhD. Um, and so, you know, my kids were like, if this is something you want to do, go for it. Just go ahead and do it and, you, and, and stop worrying about us. They were like, stop worrying about us. You need to go do some things for yourself sometime. So um, I think family is very important. Um, I hope your family is supportive of your um, efforts to get your PhD because there are times when I have to study. Um, there are times when I can't um, always be involved or go to things um, with my friends and my family members and they understand. Um, I just got done taking my qualifying exams and um, 
I've been studying, you know, really intensely for the, like probably the last two or three weeks. And my mom is a talker. So whenever I'm around her, she just loves to talk. But when I was at her house and I was studying, she would be like, okay, I'm gonna go in the other room because I know you need to study. <laughs> or I'm going to go upstairs so I don't talk to you. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's been great. It's been great being in, in school with my students, too. And hopefully my son and I will maybe graduate in the same year. So we'll see. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for that. Uh, my father used to ask me all the time, when are you going to finally go and finish going to school? And when I got my doctorate, I told him, and he said, can you prescribe medication yet? I said, no, I'm not that kind of doctor. And then he said, well, when are you going to go back to school so you can do that? <laughs> I was like, no, I'm not doing that one. Uh, we have about two minutes left. And so I want to ask Tracy, Tierra, and Chantel to give everybody on this call a one sentence piece of advice one sentence piece of advice all right so i'm going to talk slow now so that they can get that one sentence in their heads okay. and i'm going to, who's going to go first i'll go first my sentence has a semicolon in it just so we know <laughs> go for it when you get to grad school, know that you are here for a reason. You are put in your position for a reason, semicolon. If not you, then who? Beautiful, thank you so much. Who's gonna go next? I'll take a stab at it. Um, right. And this is my own mantra. I make sure that wellness is a priority. Thank you, very important. All right, Tracy, you're up. Mm. Be, um, become, mm. become, um, I don't want to necessarily say friends, but become, know, know your advisor well. Know Very your advisor well. Very important advice. Very important advice. Well, thank you so much, ladies. I greatly appreciate you allowing me to grill you. And uh, hopefully we'll get to see each other soon. I have uh, met these ladies face to face. Tracy never, Tierra once, never. and didn't know who she was when I met her. And Chantel, of course, works uh, with me here. So I have met her a few times. So thank you so much. And back to you, Nick. Thank you. Yeah, that was a great panel. And if either of our graduate students uh, from our student panel want to stick around, I'm sure there will be a couple of questions specifically looking for uh, other student insight. Uh, somebody I've even seen, seen in the chat. Um, we're going to move on to our q and uh, I have a couple here queued up uh, that were sent directly to me. So I'll ask those first. In the meantime, please feel free to keep putting them into the chat. And then after I ask these first couple, we'll open uh, the floor for anybody who has questions. Um, and the first one um, is specifically about scholarships. Um, students are wondering how they can get scholarships or fellowships specifically at the master's level. Um, so I turn it over to our associate uh, dean. Jeff, if you want to introduce yourself and you can respond to that first question. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Jeff Perfnick. I'm the Associate Dean for Student Affairs, and I'm also an Associate Professor in the Department of English at Wayne State. Uh, so in general, for funding, anytime, anytime you go to the grad school website or any page on the grad school website, you'll see at the top of the page a link that says funding, and that'll lead you to all the information on scholarships and awards. So for master's student funding in particular, our largest awards are the master scholarships, and a call for those will go out in March of this year. So you want to keep an eye out for that, that will go directly to your email. Uh, but also, as mentioned earlier, it's always good to check in with your graduate program director about funding opportunities. There's also a couple more specific master's uh, scholarships that have uh, additional criteria, but you can find all of those on our funding page. Excellent. Thanks, Jeff. Um, Chantel has her hand raised. Yeah, um, this is my first semester receiving a scholarship. So what I would say is don't stop applying. Even if you don't get a scholarship the first year, continue to apply because there's still funding out there. You're still eligible as a student and it may just take a little journey for it. So make sure you don't stop applying for those scholarships. Yeah, and if uh, I know sometimes graduate students 
uh, don't do this as much, but make sure to fill out your FAFSA no matter what. That's, uh, that is critical uh, at all levels of higher education. Um, our next question, uh, this is for our Associate Dean Sokol Todi. Um, one question that we got is somebody who's on the grad school website and is wondering what a postdoc is. They've heard of doctoral students, they've heard of PhDs, but what is a postdoc and why, why would I want to be a why would I want to be a postdoc? <laughs> That's a great question. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sokol Todi, Associate Dean for Postdoc Affairs at the Grad School. Um, yeah, postdocs are a bit of an interesting uh, thing. Um, they are trainees. They are done with their PhD studies, but they're not quite yet fully independent professionals. Uh, usually, postdocs, we see them mostly in the STEM fields, but uh, we at Wayne State and also at other universities um, are seeing postdocs in other areas as well. So a postdoc is somebody who recently has completed their PhD, has earned their degree, and they want to gain a bit more training before they become, for example, um, independent faculty in academia. In fact, it's now essentially a prerequisite to complete a postdoctoral training before somebody applies even for uh, a job as a professor in most academic fields and especially in the STEM fields. Um, but even for routes of professionalism like industry, government, um, postdocs are becoming more and more frequent as frequent as well. And so these are usually two to six year uh, training programs where somebody learns to do a lot more research, uh, does a lot more teaching. Um, there are no academic classes to think of the way that we think about them, but the person, this trainee, this postdoc gets the opportunity to get more and more ingrained in their field of interest. Personally, I think these are, a postdoc is also a fantastic time to switch fields a little bit. Let's say that the area of research you are conducting as a PhD student isn't quite your cup of tea. You want to do something a bit more different. Well, a postdoc is a perfect, perfect time to switch directions. I did that the best decision I've made career-wise uh, so far, uh, perhaps ever, who knows? But um, yeah, it's, it's really a great way to transition between getting your PhD and learning how to become fully independent and then pursuing either academia or a different route as a profession. So I hope that um, answers it, Nick. Let me know if I should expand on any of those aspects. Yeah, I think so. Um, there was a question in the chat about also about um, if, if there's a name for a postdoc for people who, is, who need more training after they receive a master's. I don't know if that would just be a doctoral so, program. Um, it, is, it depends on the master's. If it's a terminal master's, there is still a way to receive additional training. Those are not technically talked called postdocs anymore. They have other uh, names depending on the university or the institution where the training will be conducted. Uh, that's again for those that are terminal master's degrees. For those who are not terminal masters, then yes, uh, the PhD would be the next step to get that additional training. Gotcha, thank you. And I well, think the Dean wants to add something to that. Yes. <laughs> And I can also offer, uh, Louis, I've seen you before. Your, your face is familiar. Uh, what area are you studying in? Could you unmute and tell me? So I am studying in English. However, I created my own specialization in disability studies uh, in English. So ah. literary and cultural studies. We're going to go with that to make it more dense or uh, more vague. Okay, so uh, that's very interesting actually. Uh, certificates are also a way that you can also build upon a master's degree. And especially in an area like yours where you're looking at English and then disability studies, there are certificates in disability studies. And some of those programs will also actually allow you to kind of tailor their certificate to support where you want to go as a career. Uh, I will encourage you strongly though to consider getting a PhD and maybe you should consider getting a PhD in a very interdisciplinary area because it sounds like you have some very interesting ideas on what you wanna do. So feel free to reach out to us and we'll talk about it. Awesome. Um, our next question is for um, Todd, our, other, our third associate dean here. Um, this comes from a student who I guess saw 
some of the new programs that are being offered, one in the College of uh, Engineering and one in the business school. Um, and they're wondering how new programs get approved and, and what are the criteria that uh, makes it so that the university actually like approves it and it becomes uh, part of, part of the, the, uh, the school or college. And you're on mute, Todd. <laughs> There we go. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Todd Luff. I'm another associate dean at the graduate school, uh, associate dean of academic affairs. Um, so that's a great question, and it's actually fairly complicated because it is uh, new programs are evaluated and approved at different levels. So um, at every um, academic unit is really where a new program originates, and it's uh, the people, the, the faculty in those academic units are the experts in the field and they know when there's a new area that needs to be uh, explored or would make a, a, a useful um, and interesting degree program. And so there's a, there's a huge evaluative uh, process that occurs at the department or program level. And the role of the graduate school is, essentially is after that and we make sure that the, any new program that's, a, that's proposed by a department meets the minimum requirements for, uh, for that degree that, uh, that are part of the structure of the university. And it's a combination of all of those things, uh, the, the, the efforts at the program or departmental level and the overview of the graduate school and, and, and to a large degree, the provost's office that are all required before a program can be fully approved and then um, and initiated. So I hope that answers your question. Um, if, if I miss something or there's additional things, let me know and, um, and I'll be happy to expand on that. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I know it's a complex <laughs> process. To add to that. I, know it, uh, I know it's a complex process and I think Dr. Amanda has something to add to that too. Yeah. So <clears throat> at my previous institution, I actually had a, uh, a competition, so to say, not really a competition, but actually had graduate students propose new programs. And um, who better to propose the programs that we should have than those who are pursuing education with us. So if anyone here is interested in actually proposing something new, something innovative, please reach out to us and we will talk to you about how to actually uh, go through the process. It, it can be very informative to you too as a student to think about where your field is going. So it was, it's also a very educational aspect of what we do. That's a great idea. We'd love to hear new ideas about new programs from, from everybody. And, and I agree, students are really um, probably have a better idea of what they would like to see in a program than um, those old faculty members. And, um, as, and also, as if you still have questions, you can use the raise hand function in the chat in the, on Zoom as well, and we'll be sure to get to you as well. And then Jeff has been responding to a couple of questions specific to financial aid, scholarships, and everything in the chat. Um, another question from the chat earlier was uh, students were, and this might be if either of our, uh, if Tiara or Tracy are still on, not sure if they are, but um, looking for, healthy food options on campus. And in, I believe the words of the question were not just fatty foods. I know that's a question that I was curious about myself when I first uh, got on, on campus a while ago. Um, and it looks like somebody just responded to that already. Tracy, um, Tracy, I don't know if you wanna share any more details or Tiara, if you have any thoughts on, on that. Sure, I think it depends on what you like to eat as well. I mean, I think Detroit is a great place for foodies. There's, you, I mean, you can get anything. I mean, you like if you like pizza, there are even uh, some healthy pizza type options. I mean, where you know everything is not covered in cheese, and and there are lots of uh, vegan options. Um, and I mean, there are places downtown. There are also places close to campus. I think the three places that I mentioned in um, in the chat are are pretty close to campus. Um, my niece works at um, this place called Q's. I think it's called Q's Kitchen. It's on uh, West Graham Boulevard. It's on uh, Woodward near West Graham Boulevard. Um, they have vegan options as well. Um, but but there's 
there's lots and lots of places, Mediterranean places. I don't think there's a shortage of, um, you, can find, you can find healthy options. Awesome. Yeah, that's a, and there's a lot of great options and it looks like some other people are uh, providing some responses as well. Um, here's another question. We have a, a new MBA student specifically looking for employment opportunities, either possibly through Wayne State, and would just like to know where to start. Um, I can quickly answer that. Um, I would recommend reaching out to career services. Um, they largely deal with undergrads, but they also have, uh, they do a really good job of not only preparing people for interviews, but also uh, they have a lot of connections with the business world, a lot of companies around Michigan and uh, have, have good access to open positions. Not, they, you know, they're not gonna guarantee you a job, but they can at least point you in the right direction. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any insights into that as well. I'll quickly add, um, you can go to Handshake as an MBA student. Um, and also the Elder School has its own career placement center. So you can talk to the folk in the career placement center as well. There are flash internships, meaning they have like short internships, there are paid internships as an option too. So there are a variety of things that you can consider for um, potential work. Awesome. Um, other questions that people would like to ask the, the audience or ask any of us in the graduate school, other students, um, feel free to, you know, you can raise your hand, you can just blurt it out. I think we're, we're at a point now where you just take any open questions that you might have. Uh, you have one more question in the chat here that says, I'm curious about how to make connections with faculty when you're looking for potential assistantships and research experience. It seems to be all about who you know, but without in-office time, like pre-COVID, it's hard to make connections with folks you don't have classes with. Uh, I think I'll ask uh, Jeff to answer that question. Sure, how to make contact with, with faculty? Are we thinking about currently in a program or when you're applying to a program? I guess I could, I guess I can consider both of those. Often when you're applying to a program, faculty are happy to talk to you about their emphases and those opportunities. And that can be a good way to start talking, talking to people in your program before you arrive uh, in a department. When you're in a department, I think it's best to approach that uh, within discussion with your program director, because some departments will have particular ways of, uh, of assigning those things, or at least there's a certain, certain practices within the department that are good to follow. Um, here's another question. Uh, so actually, we have two questions specifically looking for resources um, that are specific to programs. Um, we have one student who is looking for a research supervisor who deals with uh, leather waste and biopesticides, and another student asking about the, uh, the Mailer program, um, similar to being a human resources master's degree. Well, I don't have answers to that. Maybe Jeff can point you in the right direction to those. Jeff, do you want to respond to those in the chat? Um, and then we have another question asking if there's any child care available for graduate students or financial assistance given. Does anybody have any insights into that? one? Jeff, do you know about our um, child care availability? No, I wouldn't want to answer that. It looks like Tracy has already provided the URL. I was gonna say, I don't wanna, I don't wanna, I'm, I'm afraid of giving misinformation on that one. So I wanna go to the website. There's been a lot of work um, by folks in the graduate school over the years to make sure that graduate students have childcare options as well as assistance. Um, I, if there is not the information at that link that you're looking for, Rachel, please reach out to our office and we'll provide you with as much information as we can get together for you, particularly for your own personal situation. Yeah, they, they did a big survey of uh, staff and students about um, their, everybody's situation with childcare and um, kind of what their, what the needs are. Um, and so I know they've print, uh, made the findings available. I'm not sure what happened after that. I know there was something. So um, yeah, definitely check out that link that Tracy put in the chat. That'll be a good start. Um, and the graduate school can help provide you some, uh, uh, personal, some direction there on where to go with your personal situation. Uh, other questions? 
I may have missed one or two in the chat up further up. So if uh, I did, feel free to just say them out. No, maybe not. Okay. Well, if you do, I mean, you can still ask um, here. Um, we'll be sending out a survey here afterwards, or you might already be in your inbox. Please feel free to reach out to um, any of us here afterwards. If you have questions that might pop up, graduate school is here to help. And um, yeah, thank you for attending today. Um, the, the, the graduate school was, uh, is, is happy to meet all of you. Um, I'll be taking a look through the chat once more, and we will be sure to um, connect you with any answers that you might need. And um, yeah, that should be about it. Thanks again, everybody, and have a good rest of the day.